Hey, welcome to 86, where I help line cooks become leaders and I help leaders grow. So if that's something that interests you, subscribe to the channel for more content like this and leave any comments or questions you have down below. So today we're talking about bad managers. Mm. And I don't even think, like, nobody wakes up thinking to themselves, well, I'm going to be a bad manager today. Like, they don't do that. I don't understand little self-reflection some people have. But anyways, I have 10 things that I've decided I'm going to make a list about. Obviously, this will n none of these lists will ever be non-exhaustive. These are just 10 things that I think stick out more than others. So if there's any traits that you think should be added to the list, make sure to leave them in the comments, right? So the first one that I put on my list is no standards. Now, when I say no standards, I mean they don't have a solid prep list. They don't have a solid inventory list. They don't have standardized recipes. When people come in, there is no set like thing for how anybody is supposed to prep anything. There's no plan of action that gets made. The recipes are just kind of whatever. Say you're making chicken parmesan. Well, there's no recipe for chicken parmesan. So Bob makes his chicken parmesan one way. Rachel makes their chicken parmesan another way. Right. So you have competing standards and that creates a lack of consistency and it creates a type of power vacuum. And when I say a power vacuum, what I mean is that if Bob is more dominating or Rachel's more dominating, what's going to happen is their way of doing chicken parmesan. They're going to start lording that over other people and making them do that their way. You've Everybody has seen in a kitchen before somebody that they insist that you make gravy this way or that you do the chicken that way or whatever. In some of these other kitchens, that's prevented because we have a standardized recipe. We have a certain way of doing it. So you have something to fall back on and be like, look, you know, I know that you're telling me to do X to chicken parm, but the standardized recipe clearly says that we're supposed to add oil here. We're supposed to use a mixture of Parmesan and Asiago, for example, just throw, throw, throwing some shit out there. Then it doesn't really fucking matter what Bob has to say about how they want the chicken parm because the standardized recipe represents the will of the executive chef and they are God in that kitchen. The next one is lack of communication. Pat calls out of work the day before. He normally comes in at 10, does a little bit of prep work, then they, they do lunch service or whatever. Susan also calls out. This was done the day before. So the manager doesn't communicate this to anybody. So you show up, you're doing your normal prep stuff, and then you notice it's 10 o'clock and, oh, that's weird. Normally, normally uh, Pat's like 10 minutes early, whatever, oh, whatever. And you keep doing it. All of a sudden, it starts getting closer to service, and you notice Pat's nowhere to be found. Where... Normally he does the spaghetti. I was just leaving the spaghetti for him, you know? And then you start realizing the other person, Susan's not there either. What the fuck is going on? Where's the manager? And the manager's, you know, back on his keyboard. And you're like, dude, where the fuck is everybody? And he's, oh yeah, Pat and Susan uh, called out. Like one had a doctor's appointment and the other one was like violently ill. They were in the ER last night or whatever. So you didn't think that maybe this might be information I would need to know. And for people that are either new to the industry or not in the industry, I'm going to explain something to you. When we have a bunch of people and we have like three or four people come in before lunch service, we have usually like a list of things that we need to do. Our me's get me set up, do prep and whatever. A lot of times we'll end up in these situations where we get a good flow going. Susan might be the one that normally comes in and does the romaine. It is not written in stone that she does the romaine, but she likes doing it, and it takes a little bit of weight off of everybody else. Pat likes to cook the spaghetti. So you have one person that normally chops like a case or two of romaine. Somebody else does, you know, whatever. They make X amount of pounds. They do one or two bags of spaghetti or whatever, whatever it is. Just the point is that Normally, there's kind of like these assumed expectations that you start having after you've worked with people long enough. It's kind of like a silent agreement that this is what we do. And everybody's kind of okay with it. That's just kind of like the workflow. Uh, you like doing the fish. Pat likes doing the spaghetti. And Susan likes doing the... Well, they don't come in. Those things just aren't getting done. But had you known, either the day before or right away in the morning, you would have then been able to change your approach to the prep list. Your your workflow and what you decide to do, how you order it, will change depending on who you actually have in the kitchen working with you. So if this isn't communicated, you start making assumptions about like, well, once so-and-so gets here, they're gonna do X, Y, Z. Number three is inconsistent rules or product. Rules 
that aren't rules until they're rules. People that have dealt with this before know exactly what the fuck I'm talking about. You don't know that you're breaking a rule until you're like in the middle of breaking the rule without realizing it. But then you start to notice that, wait a minute, this was a rule yesterday and now so-and-so's doing it and they're not getting in trouble. The manager just walked fucking right by them and didn't say anything. What the fuck is that about? Inconsistent products. One of the places I used to work at had a really bad problem with this. So I would do the order. I would have everything I needed. I even had a cheat sheet of like, these are the, all the, these are the things written out on a Word document that we need to order in the amount. And then I also sent the Excel document. That Excel document had color coordinated things. So green meant we are 100% great on these things. Yellow meant, hey, you need to look at the numbers. We may need some, but we could probably get through like another rush or two with this. But this is stuff that, you know, within the next couple of days, I'm probably going to be ordering. And red was, we will not get through a lunch service tomorrow without this product coming in on the truck in the morning. So that that's how I would do the list. I would send this list to the owner. Now the owner was really bad about control and power. So what he would do is he would go through and line item veto things that I said that I needed. One of the things on the menu, for example, would be truffle fries. Well, there's a truffle oil that gets ordered for the truffle fries. It's like $115 for a case of truffle oil. I don't know what it is now, but that's what it was when I ordered it. So he would see that I ordered truffle oil on this list and he would cross that off and not order the truffle oil. So then what would happen is I would be in the middle of service. We no longer have truffle oil. Then I look like a fucking idiot. Then the server has to write it down on her notepad. The servers had these pads that they carried around. And the reason why they carried those pads around was because of all the line item vetoes he would do. We would run out of tons. I mean tons of pro 10, 12 items at a time sometimes. It was awful. And I used to take money out of the register, go across the street to the store, get what we needed. Because my concern was the server's going to look like an idiot because somebody ordered something. We didn't have it. She didn't realize that. I thought it was coming in on the truck because I ordered it, but it didn't get ordered. Now the guest has a bad experience and they write a Yelp review. If you want to know what this restaurant was, follow me on threads and I'll put the, uh, I'll put the, the link to the, the Yelp thing on my threads so you can see i'm not going to say it here i'm not going to put it on blast here but if you are curious about it i am on threads i'm going to post it there so this is a problem this is a problem being inconsistent screws with the guest mentality and it screws up the server morale because then they get yelled at i am embarrassed to say that i'm the executive chef at this place because everybody thinks that i'm the one screwing the order up so inconsistent rules inconsistent product is definitely a bad sign of bad ownership, bad management. Number four is they have a click. Yeah, you guys know the kind of manager that I'm talking about, right? The, the manager that has his little group of the other managers and they all kind of huddle together and, you know, they tell jokes or whatever and they stuff their face with fucking donuts that they brought only for themselves and nobody else. They use secret code words to talk about certain people and they gossip. And then there's that one fucking, that one fucking brown noser, maybe a server or whatever, or maybe a cook that's trying to get in good with them, and they have their fucking head straight up the ass of management. You know, it's it's really icky. For, for people that are new to any of these videos, I've been in leadership. This isn't just coming from a line cook that doesn't know anything about management, right? This is why I'm saying this. Managers will tend to, on average, be closer, and some places even have rules that managers aren't allowed to fraternize with the staff. But there is a difference between being a professional manager in a position and kind of running your own little click where the kitchen lead gets away with fucking murder. There's no disciplinary action taken. They get to do whatever they want. And this person sucks at their fucking job. The assistant manager or the executive chef just kind of laughs it off or they don't think it's a big deal or they tell you this is the best one. They tell you, oh, yeah, we'll talk about it. Yeah, we'll work it out. And then they don't do shit. And then that person just gets to keep being a dick, keep doing these other things things on this list and you just have to deal with it or find another job. Usually when stuff like this starts coming out later, whether you have an HR department or not, most most restaurants don't. This stuff starts coming out later than you get gaslit when you have an attitude with the person that is being a shithead and you know you've been dealing with their shit for like 6 months and you finally do something, you finally snap and now you're the asshole, right? So number five on my list is no respect. They don't have respect for the little work that needs to be done. These are usually the same people that will tell other people that they need to scrape their dishes off, but then when he has to do it, or she, or they, they take the dishes back and they just plop them down and they expect the dishwasher to handle it. They're an executive chef, assistant manager, whatever. They never help out on the line. They're always in the, in the back on their computer, clicking and clacking. These guys, these guys suck. 
the rule is that you start out with respect for everybody because we're all human here. We're all humans on this earth. We all deserve a baseline level of respect. Disrespect is what should be earned. Your shitty attitude, the way that you treat others, your lack of integrity, that earns disrespect. A manager or somebody that is in a position of leadership should have respect for everybody that works there because they're the ones that keep everything going. If the dishwasher didn't show up on a busy Friday night service, the restaurant would be screwed. Yes, the cooks can do the dishes. The manager can also do the dishes. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt the kitchen. It doesn't put us further behind because the person that was working on the line now has to go do the dishes. Maybe the manager, instead of staring at his fucking receipts at 7.30 in the middle of a busy service, could get his ass in the dish pit and scrape some fucking plates. Number six, mansplaining or being condescending to others. I think that if you're a man, you can still mansplain to other men. And being a condescending asshole is something that I think is very... Like, definitely a red flag for management. Easy example for this, there was this one person that I worked with that they actually worked for some really awesome people. They were really good at their job. I was learning things from them, you know, asking questions. They're, they're really good. I shit you not, a manager went up to this person and mansplained cutting onions to them. There's this term when you are lording your power over someone being condescending acting like they're stupid um, that they that they don't know what they're doing even though they've been doing this for years the term is called learned helplessness what learned helplessness is is a kind of like a psychological condition and we've a lot of people have experienced this before now the way the easiest way to explain what learned helplessness is when you were in school and you took a test were you the person that turned your test in right away? Like, were you usually one of the first, like, three or four people done? Were you one of the last people done? Now, if you're one of the first people done, you may not be able to relate to this quite as much. But if you're like me and you were a DNF student, what would happen is you're in the middle of your test. You're maybe halfway through, maybe less, just depends on how hard it is. And you start seeing people get up and go to the front, turn their test in. Everybody's turning their test in. And pretty soon there's only a handful of people left. It's just you and a few other people. Now, what's going through your mind is you're no longer thinking as much about the test. You're looking at this being like, I'm never going to get these answers. Everybody else is basically done. I'm a fucking idiot. Look at this. Like everybody else is done with their tests and I'm sitting over here trying, like struggling with this. And you start kind of having this almost like anxiety kind of go through you because of this, this is what learned helplessness is. And you do even worse on the test, especially the second half of the test, just from, you know, other people doing something before you got to it because you're measuring yourself by their standards. And I can sit here and say, don't ever do that. That doesn't do any, everybody does it. It's really hard to break that habit of. Don't measure yourself with somebody else's ruler. But at the same time, this this is what learned helplessness is. So when you have somebody that makes you feel like you're an idiot, you've been doing this for 10 years, but for some reason, you just can't seem to make anything. It feels like you're always making a mistake. You're always screwing something up. It's probably because you have a manager that is acting this way towards you and making you feel like you're two inches tall and like you can't do anything. And so the way that your brain works starts to function differently. And coming out of that shell is extremely hard. And there's some people that don't do it and they just have to quit. So th this, is, this is the negative impact. This is what mansplaining or being condescending to the employees, this is, this is the damage it could do to them on a real level. Like whoever came up with sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. They, they just need to just be erased from history because the fact of the matter is words do have meaning and there are ways to break people and make them feel stupid without directly insulting them. There are people that are very good about using mansplaining and condescending behavior in order to manipulate and control people. If you are going through that, I'm, I would just get out of there as soon as you can. Number seven, I wrote down hides the puzzle box. What do I mean by hiding the puzzle box? Well, have you ever done a puzzle? And most people, when they do a puzzle, they have the box and it shows you what you're supposed to make. Then the pieces are out in front of you, and then you try to logic through. These are the corner pieces. These are the edge pieces or whatever. So what some managers like to do, and I think this is a form of control, is they give you the pile of puzzle pieces in a Ziploc bag, and they keep the box for themselves, and they don't explain 
what you are supposed to be making. You have, you're really good at making puzzles, right? You've made puzzles for five years, right? You know what you're doing, but you still need a box to kind of give you an idea. This kind of goes with the whole setting standards thing too. They keep the puzzle box for themselves. When you're doing something wrong, then they come at you. You know, you're putting the edge pieces here, but they're supposed to be up here. But you don't know that because you don't have the damn puzzle box. And then they walk away and then you're like, okay, so is it on the left side or on the right? Is it at the top? Where do I put the edge pieces? So then you start putting them on the side and they're like, no, that's wrong too. This is extremely frustrating to deal with. Most people that are doing this are doing this either out of ignorance or as a form of control. I think it's kind of pathetic, honestly. So number eight, I have playing favorites. We've Everybody's seen this in a workplace because people do it all the time. They have this person that, you know, they had their friend come in, you know, that they known since whatever, since, you know, they grew up together, whatever the case is, or, you know, they, they've been buddies, they've been bar buddies for years and he got him a job. Well, the guy sucks at his fucking job. He's horrible. He doesn't know what he's doing. He burns shit all the time. He tells people what to do, but he's not even like in charge of them really. Or like it's the wrong direction, you know? Like pick your negative traits. This guy is not very good. He gets away with everything. It's kind of like I was talking about being in a clique. The manager that picks this person to be favorites over other people. Like think about it this way. I'm listing out 10 traits. I've gone through eight of them. What happens if you have six of these in one manager? Somebody with no standards that plays favorites, that's condescending to people and doesn't have respect, and they have inconsistent rules. Could you imagine working for this nightmare? So you have somebody that plays favorites. This person sucks at their job. Now, this causes a decline in morale because you know that if you tell them that they are doing something incorrectly, even if you have a standardized recipe to show them, you know what they're going to do. They're going to go tattle on you to, to daddy. You're going to be held accountable and you're going to be told that you're being bossy, that you're bossing people around too much, that you need to pull back a little bit. You know, they try to put you back in your place, so to speak. Basically, the adult version of you're not the boss of me. The favorite people tend to start not liking them very much because they get away with everything, and they act like they're better than everybody. And then we don't like the manager because they pick and choose people to do things. That The favorite is the one that gets the promotion, not you, even though they suck at their job. But they have their heads so far up the other manager manager's ass that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you do. Number nine for bad managers, I have being disorganized. This can cause a lot of disruptions to work-life balance because usually somebody that's disorganized isn't putting the schedule out in time. There's a special coming up. They forget about it. They don't order anything for it. They don't put the order in when they're supposed to. They lose things a lot. They Their, their office looks like a mess. And this can cause a lot of chaos for the people that are actually working there, especially if there are people that are organized, because it starts to kind of throw a monkey wrench in their pl Well, what are you doing? What are you doing Wednesday? Well, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing Wednesday because the schedule's not out yet, right? Being disorganized doesn't always negatively impact the employees themselves, but it's still a negative sign. And when you have disorganization clumped in with the other traits, then that could actually make for some really awful managing. Combine the other eight things on this list and then now they're also forgetting shit or they, they lose shit and don't know where things are. You put a request off in two months ago in writing and they put you on the schedule anyway and then they start acting like you've put them out because they forgot that you had a request off because they don't, they don't know where anything is or how to do anything. Number 10 and my favorite, I could do an entire video just on number 10. And that is the micromanager. Micromanagers will not delegate tasks or they won't delegate them properly. Or they will delegate them and they will watch you do everything. They often will focus on one leaf on one tree instead of the forest. They're constantly checking in on you. Constantly looking for updates. Constantly asking you if you remember to do XYZ. They aren't letting you have that self-accountability, that self-ownership, or any of that. They would rather come to you and tell you that you're holding the knife wrong. Usually micromanagers have this belief that they're the only ones capable of doing the job well, and you have to do the job exactly the way they do it. If you if you do small things, if you end up with a good product, if you're trying to make something or prep something, and you have a certain way that you like to do it, 
they don't give you room to have that ownership over what you're doing and you have to change things and do it their way. One of the biggest problems with micromanagers is that ends up you end up with this false sense of not being able to do a lot of things around the restaurant. I'll give you kind of like an extreme example, but gets my point across. You've been chopping with your right hand your whole life, but your manager is left-handed and insists that you cut everything with the left hand, and then they then they criticize your cuts that you're making with your left hand because they're not uniform. A lot of times, micromanagers, the reason why they do it is because they're insecure, and this is their way of kind of maintaining power and control. They don't have any trust for the employees, and they feel like they're the only ones that can do it. You know that you've been micromanaged before if you've ever thought to yourself while they're delegating or while they're constantly looking over your shoulders, well, do you wanna do it then? Like you may as well because you're telling me literally everything to do. Rather than the micromanager having notes for you, giving you feedback on how to improve the thing that you're doing, maybe they've done it before or whatever. Now, a lot of times micromanagers are narcissistic, a lot of times also micromanagers have an insecurity or they might feel threatened by somebody. So they feel like they need to kind of do this as a way to exert control over others. A lot of times these micromanagers will try to do everything themselves. And a lot of this is because they don't trust anybody else to do it. They kind of have this attitude of like, I'm the only one capable of doing this right. I've tried to get other people to do it, but they won't do it. But it's really, it's, it's a false feeling. The truth is that they're just not used to doing it the way that this person wants them to do it. A lot of times too, being a micromanager, they wanna know every single detail, every, every single thing you're doing, and they will go out of their way to try and find a problem with it. What's funny about this is if that micromanager hadn't been there today, everything would have ran fine, everything would have ran smooth. But because they are so up your balls on everything, when you're micromanaging somebody versus coaching, so when you're coaching, you're giving somebody tools for them to use in order to improve their craft. What a micromanager will do is they will take the tools. They don't trust you that you're going to use the tools to get the job done. And they basically will feel like they need to do it themselves. The problem with the micromanager is it's really hard to draw a line between a manager that is setting standards for the restaurant and that's coaching you to get better from rules and things that are arbitrary and unnecessary. If you want to know the opposite of this and what it takes to be a good manager or trainer, you can click on the video. It should be showing up right about now. And then I also have a restaurant's basics playlist that you can tap into with about 28 videos. Please leave me a like and share this with a friend or somebody that you think might be struggling as a line cook. But otherwise, I hope you guys have an awesome day and I'll see you on the next one. Peace.